And now it's my pleasure to introduce Sekou Kalund. Sekou is a managing director at JP Morgan Chase and Company and Northeast Divisional Director for the Consumer Bank. In his role as divisional director, Sekou oversees all branch teams in the Northeast, covering five regions with over 7,000 associates and advisors. Sekou currently serves on the board of Inroads and the Public Policy and International Affairs Program, and has previously served as a trustee for Duke University School of Public Policy, New York City Parks Foundation, and the Council of Urban Professionals. His civic contribution and corporate success have been recognized in several organizations, including in Ebony Magazine's 2020 Power 100 list for the Titans of Industry category and Face to Face Africa's 2019 30 Black Stars list. Sekou has been featured on numerous publications for his work, including the BBC, Forbes, NBC, CNBC, Black Enterprise, Essence, and more. Well, thank you uh, for that generous uh, introduction. I want to thank everyone for joining us today at the Next Frontier Conference, as we are all on a mission to accelerate the 100,000 student and early stage adults on the pathway for what we call Next Frontier Careers by the year 2030. Now, this conference has been highlighting sectors with incredible content and speakers. It was great to see Eric, an uh, incredibly successful entrepreneur, talking about his, his pathway as well. And we want to really provide this audience and entrepreneurs with that access, awareness, and belief. And so as you think about today's session, it's going to be an incredible panel, and they're going to share insights on how you can break into the fintech uh, industry and, and practical ideas and solutions so we can make sure everyone is getting a piece of this pie. And as I think about belief, uh, you know, what we really hope to achieve today in our panel and, and subsequent panels is that you can see how successful these leaders are and know that personally you have a pathway to achieve that success despite tech not being an area that historically has given minorities the belief uh, that, that they could succeed. But that's why we're here because part of it is the awareness. And so as you think about the awareness in particular of the FinTech industry, which is gonna be a $300 billion industry in the next couple of years, it's so critical specifically for people of color, that we cannot miss out on this opportunity. The last big frontier in the tech industry was in the early 2000s, where a lot of innovation happened, wealth was created, and unfortunately, women and people of color uh, missed out on that opportunity. I want to just quickly discuss the financial services industry because that is an area that has evolved because of technology. Traditional banks, as we think about them, really don't operate as traditional banks. Most of these firms have embraced technology to help our customers bank how, where, and when they want. And many firms like JP Morgan Chase spend billions and billions of dollars in our technology budget. So we have to recognize that there is a need. And one of the things we have done is commit $30 billion in investments to underserved communities, but we have that responsibility. But let me get into the panel. So we have a phenomenal, panel uh, today. And so if we could bring up the panel, what I want to do is if you could give everyone a quick overview of your background and the overview of uh, your organization, what you do, and then we'll get into a round robin, but I'll give you an order. If we could start with Leo, uh, Jim, Sig, Garrett, and Lisa, but just start off by telling our audience, you know, who you are, what you do, uh, and, and talk about your organization. So we'll start with Leo. Thank you, Sekou. Um, as mentioned, my name is Leo Pereja. I'm the pr president and co-founder of Remind, which is a technology uh, delivered via the MLSs to roughly 85% of every realtor in North America. Uh, I started as a real estate agent at the age of 19, grew up during the financial crisis, learned to maneuver um, government contracts and default distressed debt. It's actually where I went from being a practitioner into a technologist. We built software that logged in programmatically to Fannie and Freddie systems so I could do what more people did with people and do with software. Post-crisis started a private debt fund. Uh, again, streamlined processes and was able to bundle debt and sell to a secondary market, which is how I ended up in the data business as I was trying to streamline processes. But um, we now serve mostly realtors, but we're bridging that gap with financial services and connecting uh, 
uh, the consumer with their rest of their vendor providers to make life easier. Great. Thank you, Leo. Uh, Jim, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Seiko. I, I appreciate it. And Leo, uh, good seeing you. Um, my name is Jim Park. I'm, um, I'm representing um, the, the Mortgage Collaborative. I'm the CEO. But Gary, who's going to speak a little later, he and I have also started several different businesses together, and this is one of them. Uh, it's an organization uh, that is focused on giving uh, small, mid-sized originators, lenders, a kind of an even playing field relative to the larger players uh, in terms of um, sort of sharing ideas and information, but really at the end of the day to get them to be more efficient and productive and more profitable uh, in the mortgage business we're in. So uh, we currently have a little over um, 200 members uh, in the network. And as an aggregate, we do as much business as any large lender uh, in this country today. So uh, we have the sort of the buying power to do different things. One of the things that we are working on as a group is uh, launching, officially launching a, um, a VC fund to support our members' ability to create uh, solutions, technology solutions, so that they can bring their resources together to create efficiencies in their business that they have going on. The other hat that I do wear um, quite a bit, and I have done so for about seven years, is also so. Or supportive of well, maybe barriers, uh, homeownership barriers, and um, so we have worked together uh, on that as well. And and uh, it's always great to have uh, be able to do something that makes you a good living, but also do things that um, can transform the community at large. So anyway, I've been very fortunate, and so thank you for letting me be a part of this. Great, thank you, uh, Sig uh, Anderman. Would you please uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Sig Anderman. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Sig Anderman, the founder and now chairman emeritus of Ellie Mae. Um, I started Ellie Mae 20 years ago to completely automate the very labor intensive and frustrating process of getting a mortgage loan. Uh, 20 years later, we have the technology that's now used by uh, thousands and thousands of banks and mortgage companies that uh, collectively process about uh, half of all the mortgage loans made in America. We have 2,000 employees across the United States, and we continue to drive automation in this very archaic, uh, old-fashioned industry. Um, so uh, this great opportunity, of course, uh, even though uh, we started 20 years ago to automate everything, we're now 20 years into it and there's still most of the process is still manual. So there's just fabulous opportunity in this field and uh, we're still driving as hard as we can to get every mortgage done in America to be done in minutes rather than months. And, and we will certainly uh, double click on that notion of opportunity uh, but we'll quickly go to Gary uh, and Lisa, introduce yourselves, and then we'll, uh, Lisa, if you could answer the first question, we'll do a round robin, but talk about why the opportunity to enter uh, as a diverse tech worker or entrepreneur has never been better. So uh, Gary, Lisa, introduce yourself, and then Lisa, can you, uh, you know, give us some thoughts on that first question? Yeah, um, thank you for having me. This is uh, Gary Acosta. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Uh, it's a trade association uh, serving the housing industry that is um, probably the largest Latino business organization in the country right now. Uh, it is my day job, but um, you know my background is primarily in mortgage banking and various um, you know, entrepreneurial efforts in the housing space, including the Mortgage Collaborative with Jim Park. Um, but uh, my you know, love and joy is having the opportunity to, to guide and network and uh, learn from uh, this vast network that we started at NARAP, which has um, some of the most uh, innovative and exciting young entrepreneurs within that uh, Hispanic space. So uh, very excited to be part of this panel and thank you for the invitation. Thanks, Sekou, and Lisa? it's uh, thanks, Sekou, and it's an honor uh, to be here 
with my my dear friends Jim and and Gary, um, along with the other distinguished members of this panel. So I'm Lisa Rice. I'm the president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance. We're a national civil rights organization, uh, and we are also the trade association for fair housing organizations throughout the nation. And our mission, uh, our work is really to eliminate all forms of discrimination in the housing and financial space. And that includes eliminating bias in the technologies that we use uh, in housing and financial services. So our job is to make sure that when consumers do enter into the marketplace that they are treated fairly and uh, they don't experience any form of discrimination. So moving um, quickly to your answer about why the opportunity to enter uh, this industry, this $300 billion industry that we've been talking about as a diverse um, um, worker or entrepreneur um, is such a great moment right now to do that. Um, uh, is a very interesting question. It's a great question, right? Because the opportunities are so profound and I think that we're still learning uh, every day about all of the opportunities that exist. I wanna kind of focus my comments on a, a sector in the technology field that I don't think that many people have talked about and you, you may not have even talked about it yet at this conference. And that's the area of civil rights and tech, or what we call fairness and tech, or ethics and tech. Um, the whole field uh, that uh, around debiasing tech to make tech more fair when it intersects um, with folks in the marketplace. I've been saying uh, quite quite often here lately that technology is the new civil rights frontier, and we are in the nascency actually of using technology to help undo the systemic and structural barriers that have been put in place over centuries in the United States that really lock people out of opportunities to get housing, opportunities to get credit, opportunities to get employment. Uh, so we're really in pioneering territory. Uh, we, we are really at the ground level here. And so there are, there's so many challenges uh, Seku to resolve. And technology is one of the tools that can help us address things like structural racism and systemic inequality. But it will take diverse teams to develop the technology to resolve those issues. So we now know that, you know, homogenous teams will be much more likely to build more biased tech. One of the contributors to biased technology is a lack of diversity on the teams that are designing and building the tech. And we're seeing this every day in the headlines, right? We see this all the time. All of the different ways that tech is manifesting bias. Uh, everybody heard about Amazon's AI human resource system that discriminated against women. Um, we were all shocked right when the COVID crisis hit to learn that um, a widely used algorithm which determines who gets access to certain healthcare treatments was systemically uh, discriminating against black people. The Apple card, right, come, came under scrutiny as many consumers found that it seemed to be discriminating against women. We know that credit scoring systems have been found to discriminate against people of color and other underserved groups to the point where now today, your credit score actually serves as a proxy for race. That's how deeply ingrained and embedded the systemic inequality is in our financial and housing systems. Right now, as I speak, CoreLogic is being sued for the discriminatory impacts of a tenant selection screening system, you know, to determine who gets access to housing and who does not. Tech firms like Facebook are under scrutiny. In fact, my organization sued Facebook for discrimination in terms of how its digital platforms manifest bias. So companies are really, they're gravely concerned about this issue and they're looking for tech-based solutions on how to de-bias their own existing systems and new systems uh, and, and to make sure that new systems that are being onboarded are, are fair and don't, um, un, and don't discriminate against people. 
So getting in now on the ground floor at Seku and working on innovative solutions regarding how we make tech fair, how we de-bias the technologies that so gravely impact our lives is, is a profound opportunity. And, you know, if folks are interested, you know, if you're interested in technology, but also care about the ethics of tech, this is an area where you should really explore because I think it's a growth sector. Uh, Leo and Jim, it, it's really focused on advice for college graduates. So we heard uh, Lisa's comments that this is a great time to get in and there's a wide array of things you can do in tech. You could even follow the ethics of it. But how are you thinking as CEOs, both Leo and Jim, about hiring for a diverse uh, workforce? And what advice would you give uh, to the graduates out there or recently grad graduates, uh, recent graduates rather, on how to break in? Jim, do you want to go first? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know what? It's 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 um, you know I think um, Lisa always has such great perspective on things, and you know our our responsibility all, all is obviously to make a good living, take care of our families, but also to help transform the market, right? And that's the work, the great work that Lisa and everyone else on this panel is doing. And so it's, 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 it's really something for all of us to kind of think about. I think number one, I think if you're kind of coming out of college and looking to, you know, pursue a different set of careers, obviously, you, you know, you have to sort of come in as a journeyman, you have to learn the business uh, that you want to be in. Um, you know, I think, and, and also just sort of stay focused on the, the thing that inspires you, you know, whatever the business line that you want to kind of pursue. Um, and you know, and, and I know a lot of a lot of you are probably out there trying to put resumes out there, trying to get some interviews and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I just make sure that that resume tells a good story about who you are and what you're passionate about, and because you know people look at lots of different, um, lots of different resumes. I've used this a whole stack of it, but it tell tell them a story about your personal life a little bit, you know, and just humanize the resume and 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 put the best best foot forward and. Uh, I would I would make sure to do that. You know, I we certainly uh, we know that diversity, having a broader gender, both gender and and ethnic diversity, is an important part of making sure that you have the not kind of the situation that what Lisa's talking about, which is like you know people are very kind of single minded tech people. They just want to figure out a solution. Um, but if you have, if you bring in people with different perspective, these kinds of issues are less likely, to, it's not gonna eliminate it completely, but it's less likely to happen and we know that. And, and so we need to make sure that we bring in more people from all sorts of background and experience, uh, not a bunch of people, not only people from MBA from Harvard, right? Or, you know, or, or, or I don't know, or engineering degree from, you know, MIT, right? Uh, but you have, you have to bring in people with different perspective and just different experiences. And I think that's absolutely critical for our industry to move forward in the correct way. And we can all prosper, frankly. In the, if you think about the real estate and mortgage business, I mean, it's what we're going to sell like 6 million homes this year, I think, as an industry. And we're going to do about $4 trillion of mortgage origination. It's, it's a big business. And there's lots to be done. But a lot of improvements, I think as Sig mentioned earlier, a lot of improvements to, to happen in terms of efficiencies, making it easier to get a loan, but also we have to make sure that we eliminate the bias, some of the biases that we have talked about, you know, in the, at the front end of the business, where we uh, we had to give more people more opportunities in that way. So anyway, Leo, um, I'm sure you're gonna say something much more profound, so I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Jim. So I, I, I'll answer it from two buckets. One is an employee. Um, I, I am a person of color and a founder of color. So my perspective is probably different than the average. But one of the things that's Maybe. been remarkable I've, I've witnessed is folks come into our organization at an entry level position. Being low level business analyst or even an infosec team. Uh, I think you're breaking up. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I just had a gentleman of Latino descent who entered our team at the InfoSec level at 65000 And within two years, he was making 
close to 120,000 just by learning inside of the organization and staying market competitive. And we just lost them to Capital One, who's also in the fintech space for 180,000. So we've seen young people come in and be willing to almost take any position that's entry level. But once they enter an organization through grit and hard work, learn as much on their own time, get additional certifications and move up the ranks rather quickly. But I think the the part from the entrepreneurship side, which was more for Lisa's question, but I, I'd like to give my two cents on it, that I have seen that I, I think is very empowering to minorities who want to be in the spaces. Um, the amount of capital that's entered, both PropTech or FinTech, if you look at 2018 and 2019, each year respectively, over $50 billion worldwide went into those verticals, is that um, venture, pack, venture capital and growth equity and private equity from my personal experience, are really agnostic to your background. They only care about the total addressable market, how you're going to remove friction from the process, and how you're going to streamline the process. And if you have an idea, if you have a process, if you have a technology that does that, I think there's less barriers because this is a race for you know moderniz modernizing all of these processes that SIG opened up that are still manual, that are still difficult. You know, if you think of we can have. So I would encourage anyone to get into this. Ability to enter as, you know, a loan officer or a real estate practitioner, because that'll give you the experience and where the pain points and the friction are. And if you're aggressive, you can then transition that into creating a solution which scales and helps lots of people and in turn makes a lot of money. Yeah, thanks for that. You touched on another key point, and that is, you know, breaking into the fintech industry doesn't only just mean a job, although you gave us good trajectory means you could be an entrepreneur, which you which you have been. So, Sig, I want to bring you in the conversation here to think about entrepreneurs out there. Uh, you know, one new thing, and, and you alluded to it, was the access to basically capital during the ideation incubation uh, phase. So as an investor, can you talk to us uh, and give any insight for our entrepreneurs who are interested in seeking funding? Sure, um, I'd be happy to. Well, my advice would be to first understand the industry. Once you have the technical skills, um, you then have to understand the financial technology industry and in particular in my um, experience, uh, revolves around the mortgage technology industry. So I would suggest that anybody wanting to go into business start out by working for one of the thousands and thousands of banks and mortgage banks and cybersecurity organizations uh, just to get a lay of the land and uh, find out what's working and what's not working. And once you know that, you can either continue to grow, as uh, Jim mentioned, and uh, get it starting job at 65000 and three years later uh, graduate to $180,000. Uh, or you could suggest to your employer that you'd like to fan out and uh, go out on your own and create a technology, a component of this automation technology that would be helpful. Many, many companies would rather finance a organization, a small entrepreneurial organization to get a project done than do it, do it themselves and get bogged down with it and then turn around and buy that company. So um, as uh, Jim mentioned, there's, there's plenty of financing out there and plenty of funds out there, but you have to know the product. You really have to know the technology and be able to provide a convincing uh, case for whatever business you decide to go into. And right now, getting a job in the financial tech area is quite easy, frankly. If you have the passion and you have the skills, I guarantee you'll get a job. Just look up every lender out there is seeking uh, more and more automation. They need people in cybersecurity, they need people in network operations, they need programmers. 
And many, many of these jobs don't require a college degree, don't even re require an associate's degree. Many can be filled with people who go um, into the um, some of these uh, organizations that provide a one year or 18 month training program. You start start uh, at the bottom basically and just work passionately and work hard until uh, you'll work your way up the ladder so that would be my playbook for getting uh, financing to start your own company uh thanks for that and i want to bring uh gary in because you, you talked about on the last part of that like when you're already working in the industry and things you could do whether you you know launch off or your own understanding product or opportunity but let's assume for those that are in the industry now and they're just looking for, you know, how do I get a seat at the table? How do I advance my career? Uh, Gary, can you share some thoughts on for people who may be early stage uh, in, in, in fintech, what are some of the things they should do to ensure they have the seat at the table or can navigate and, and go on a solid trajectory of growth for their careers? Well, you know, first of all, uh, you know, thanks again for uh, including me in this conversation. I, I, um, you know, have a good friend uh, by the name of Sol Trujillo. He's actually a business partner of mine. He has the unique distinction of being the uh, first U.S. born Latino to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. He ran uh, a big telecom here in the United States uh, about 20 years ago that today would be the equivalent of being the CEO of Verizon, for example. He did that job for five years, was very successful, went on and became the CEO of another telecom in Europe and subsequent to that, another telecom in Australia, which was the largest telecom at the time in that continent. He has said to me the reason he was able to be successful in three continents was because of his bicultural background. His bicultural background gave him an advantage in the marketplace, especially to be able to go to different countries and different cultures uh, because his mind just thought in a broader way than most other people thought. So use your culture as an advantage, first of all. Let me just say a couple other things because I'd love to piggyback on some of the other comments that have been made so far. People who have access to capital have access to wealth and build wealth ultimately, right? Whether it's mortgage loans or whether it's uh, venture capital or business lines of credit or even all the way up to private equity. People who have connections to capital are the people who've been able to build wealth historically. And the promise of FinTech, I think, can be broken down into three categories. One, the opportunity to improve process of existing analog systems. And SIG has Sig uh, you know, founded a company that did that precisely and continues to do that. Even companies like um, Quicken Loans, which everybody knows, and recently went public and has a market cap of $45 billion, that's essentially what they've done. They've made a analog system of applying for a mortgage much more streamlined and much more efficient because of technology. But technology and FinTech also gives us the opportunity to reach broader audiences through e-marketing and to use new metrics to be able to qualify more people for financing. So to me, the trillion dollar opportunity in FinTech is in the opportunity to democratize access to capital. And people who start to develop solutions in that regard, not only will be doing a great service for humanity, but will be able to build enormous wealth for themselves and their companies. You know, that, that is a, a great point. As I think about my uh, former uh, role, I basically ran a program called Advancing Black Pathways uh, at J.P. Morgan Chase where we invested in the black community across education, career and wealth creation. And as I hear you talk, I'm reminded that even within the black community, entrepreneurs have 12 times the net worth of black non-entrepreneurs. But then when you do have that successful career pathway and particularly in tech, it opens up a great opportunity to begin to develop and grow wealth as we heard. So you've covered uh, uh, all of you just again, from start why this is a great time you gave, in pract you gave practical examples of how uh, someone came in, you know, was able to continue to earn and, and now traded away, making $180,000 a few years out of college. And you also talked about funding, democratizing capital as a, as a particular opportunity. So I think this has all been great. So I want to end with just one last question, uh, you know, for all of you. Uh, and that is, you know, 
what what more like as as I'm sitting on the call, if I'm a student or entrepreneur, like what, what should I do uh, uh, tomorrow? Like uh, what are some of the things outside of what you've shared, uh, whether it's around, you know, finding out my interest in a particular area of tech? Like what are some of the next immediate next steps uh, that would be useful, you feel, uh, for these uh, students? Any, anyone can jump in. I'm sorry for now. Uh, uh, we'll start with you. Oh, go ahead. I, I, I don't mind. I'll jump in. I, I have a, a you know a story, and I, I touched on it a little bit. And and uh, I was using the word the term access to capital a lot. And I was in the middle of a roundtable in New York City talking to people uh, about that very topic. And somebody corrected me and said, you know, let's stop using the term access to capital and start using the phrase connection to capital, because there's going to be a 30 year old or a 20 something year old white kid tomorrow who's going to raise 30 million dollars for the idea he had for an app. And it's not because he has access to something, it's because he has a connection. So my advice right now, because especially those that are in you know, technology worlds, I mean, you, you tend to be very sort of laser focused on your skill sets and you know, technology is something that probably you, know, you personally enjoy, but you gotta go out there and make connections. You have no idea you know, how those connections could lead to something else. Um, and there's a lot of different platforms where that can happen and certainly basic living is one. But go out there, meet people, get uh, to know people and get them to get to know you. Those connections can be life changing. That's great. Great practical advice. If you look at the technology and connection to capital, uh, unlike, let's say, real estate, raising a real estate fund or raising a hedge, you know, starting a hedge fund, all, all that stuff, con uh, starting actually a venture capital fund is easier uh, because typically the, the path you go through in raising a venture capital is you have a skill. You have a technology skill, you have an idea, and you can, you can with your idea, you raise funds. If you... The other asset classes are very hard because you have to go to the right school, you have to join the right golf club. It, it's just, it's that to break down that barrier is very difficult. Um, that's why I think a lot of diverse individuals have more success in starting a venture capital fund than Ooh. other assets. And so that's where, that's why this is so exciting. All the people that have great ideas that are really pumped up about the, whether it's fintech business or any technology business that you have an idea around, ultimately build your skills, learn as much as you can. And if you have a great idea, this is an opportunity to really start something you're on your own, maybe with a group of people, but it's really ultimately a way to get that wealth built and maybe at the same time, create a solution that makes sense for the communities that you care about. So that I think if you get those two things done at the same time, you know, that's, that's, that's a home run. Great, great advice. Uh, Lisa Sig? Yeah, sure. Well, my uh, suggestion would be to um, use your employer as a source of funding. It's probably the easiest way to uh, uh, get a new company started because if you go to work for a company that utilizes your services and you work hard and you're passionate and you keep your eyes open and keep your ear to the track, you're going to know what's needed and what that company really needs to fill some gaps in its technology. And then going to that employer um, and just suggesting that you can go out and start a enterprise um, and do it more efficiently and for less cost than doing it internally. I would say that is the best way using somebody else's dime to get your company started and then you have a very, very likely acquirer when you get mature and you succeed. I'm going to give the last word to Lisa, but I want to pivot the question because I love that notion of technology is the new civil rights frontier. So a lot of people don't think about tech in that way. So any practical steps where you could double click on that, I think is helpful, but answer whatever you want. But I just love that line, technology is the new civil rights frontier. 
It really is. And it's a growth field and it's a critical field. Every company is looking for how to de-bias its tech, particularly in the housing and financial services space, employment, healthcare, because they're, they're high stakes, right? You could be susceptible to liability and you want to make sure that you're not harming people. So um, it's, a, it's really a growth opportunity. But one of the things that I want to encourage people to do is to find a really good mentor and um, really put a pin in the point that good mentor, mentor mentee relationships are relationships that are authentic and real. Um, I am where I am right now today because of my mentor who um, actually saw more in me than I saw in myself when I was a young 20 year old kid uh, uh, working as an intern in her in, in a company that she led. But she saw something in me that I didn't know that I had and she pushed me um, to do things that were outside of my comfort zone, things that I never would have done. And I, I really strongly encourage people to align themselves with individuals and not to be afraid to align yourself with people who is sort of where you want to be, like they're headed in the direction that you want to go. Um, I tell my son all the time, and I'm sure our audience have been told the same thing by their parents, but I, I tell my son all the time, if you hang around five people who aren't going anywhere, you'll be the six. But if you hang around five people who are going someplace and following their passion, you'll be the sixth person who's doing that. So really look for those good relationships that are going to push you, um, um, stretch you, uh, and look for people who support you and who believe in you. Well, I want to thank everyone. I'll do a quick recap of some, again, good takeaways that I heard uh, on the both soft skills and hard skills. So some of those softer skills, you know, like connectivity, building out, investing in your network, the same way you invest in your skill set. Uh, also finding that mentor, someone who can give you those insights that help you navigate uh, your career journey. Also leverage a company as a learning ground. Be keen to understand what is making your industry or product move and try to uncover an opportunity for you as an entrepreneur. And then finally, it is the grit. It is the working hard. It is being innovative, leaning in, understanding, being flexible. Uh, we heard pieces of that in everyone's uh, individual story. And the final thing I'll say about technology too, that there are, more, there are many opportunities. There's not just one thing you've heard pieces in FinTech, that was this panel, but it also impacts other things like communities and fairness and, and equality. And so leveraging technology to improve our society is really the opportunity that's before you. And so I want to thank uh, my esteemed panelists. Thanks for your insight. We're going to bring this panel to a close and I'll turn it over uh, back to uh, base 11.